Hello everyone, William Rader here. I'm the founder of Well Attended, and today we're here with Tom Britton for part two of our three-part series on print marketing. Today we're gonna to be talking about how to use your print material and how to convert that for social media and beyond. If you're joining us live right now, what I'd love you to do is just introduce yourself in the chat room. Let us know who you are, where you're from, and the types of shows that you produce. That way we can cater this workshop to you and your needs. Also, at any time, if you've got a question for Tom as he's going through this workshop, go ahead and just leave a message in the comments below so that I can kind of moderate those and ask Tom so everybody can get their questions answered. Now, before we begin this workshop, Tom, can you let us know a little bit about yourself? Yeah, happy to. I and mean, thanks, thanks for hosting this. I really appreciate it. This is only the second time I've ever used my YouTube channel to do a live broadcast. Um, is that true? The first time I've ever done a live workshop, certainly. So thanks to you and well attended for for helping out. Yeah, we're really excited to be doing this on your channel this time. Well, it's nice to have someone who has expertise in doing workshops to to help me and just to give you a little credit right at the top to help me develop this, design it, and so I'm going to be doing most of the talking. But it's because you gave me the ability. You helped a lot. So oh, it, we appreciate that. Thank you. And also um, just another note before we get into this, uh, all of the slides that Tom will be sharing, those are going to be available in the show notes right at the bottom of this uh, YouTube feed. And that's going to take you over to our blog for the episode of this uh, workshop. So that's episode 71, uh, print marketing uh, in social media and beyond. You can just scroll down there and you can enter your email and you'll get the slides to all of this presentation. So don't worry about taking notes or screen sharing. All of these will become available for you. Uh, so when you guys are introducing yourself in chat, Tom, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us how you use print marketing uh, in social media to get those ticket sales. Yeah, we will do. Yeah, the goal here is you don't have to take notes. It'll be available. You can get it from William Raider's website through iTunes, Stitcher, whatever, and then also watch the rebroadcast here and also download the notes so you can really focus because today is special. We'll get into some technical stuff. Uh, let's start with me. Uh, for those of you who didn't tune in yesterday or have no idea why you're on my YouTube page, <clears throat> my name is Tom Britton. I do a science-y sort of variety show called Freak Show and Tell where, well, if you watch my most popular YouTube video, you get a very good idea. I work in the style like a comedian or a kind of funny guy doing a TED talk on stage, sort of a conversational presentation. But then I do crazy stuff and explain the science behind it. So I'll eat fire and then teach you how fire eating works. I have a degree in applied sciences, so an undergraduate degree, but I do have a love for chemistry and physics and computers, et cetera. I'm a nerd. And so I kind of break down fire eating and explain it. I do have other parts of the slideshow as well. I play with a Tesla coil and explain how I'm doing that. I do it with glass walking, et cetera. So the way you would see in a science center, you'd go and you'd see a bed of nails and they would use that to teach you a principle. Uh, I've used everything else in the sideshow except for the bed of nails to do it. The reason I'm doing this presentation is because I, I moved to Chicago a dozen years ago from the deep South, which is why you'll occasionally hear a Southern accent coming through. Although it kind of sounds like rural Iowa at this point from being in the Midwest for so long. Um, and I always joke about I live in Chicago along with every other show on earth. And that's the idea to give you that I'm, I'm competing with big dogs here that can just outspend me, period. There's no way that I can beat Hamilton, even if they weren't a really amazing show, even if they were a mediocre show. With that ad budget, I just can't get the park bench. I can't get the bus ad. So I don't compete with Book of Mormon directly. It's apples and oranges. You're going to my $35 show or their $135 show. That's not the same thing at all. But they do drive up the price of everything. So in a smaller town or in a city that wasn't so theater dense, I might be able to get a bus ad. That forces me to be a gorilla, to think like a gorilla marketer, G-U-R-E, G-U-E-R, gorilla, um, and use print materials and then social media a lot more adeptly than they have to. They can just hire someone for eight grand a, a week to, to do it for them. Lest you think I'm merely a big city boy, I am from the rural parts of Louisiana where I started performing and I'm a touring artist, which means I work what? I work what we in the uh, vaudeville era, the 1930s, would have called the tall grass, or you may think of it as the boonies or BFE, if you're from out that way, uh, just the middle of nowhere. That's where I go, and I'm able to sell tickets there as well. So these techniques don't just work if you have a dense population. It won't just work in London, Paris, New York, Stockholm, Toronto. These techniques, with some adjustment, will also work in rural parts of the world, just by way of example, the last three weeks here in the city of uh, Chicago, I'm in Uptown Buena Park, a mile north of Wrigley Field. So I'm in the city of Chicago proper by the lake. Uh, three weeks sold out of a five-week run, the last run. That ended, I think, two weeks ago. 
coming up next month, right now, a month away. I'll be right outside Detroit in a small little city. I don't remember the name of it. Sorry. Uh, if you go on my website, you can buy tickets. If you live near Detroit, there you go. Uh, 20 minutes outside the city, 20 to 45 minutes from Windsor, Canada, if you're coming that way. Um, I've sold 25% of my tickets for next month, which means I've covered my expenses already. Every single ticket now is exactly. So if you buy a $35 ticket, that is $35 in my pocket. You buy a $15 ticket, 15 in my pocket. There's no more expenses. They're covered. That gives me a lot of confidence when I book a theater and I can sell. I haven't even gone there to hang up posters yet. And I've sold a quarter of my tickets. So I know these techniques work for me. I'm hoping they work for you. As a result, I get to do about 200 shows a year and tell people my day job is fire eater. That's what I do. I produce theater shows, not always with me in them, but mostly my one man show is 90% of my, my income. I'm also a former theater owner and manager three, four years ago, I think four years ago now with my partner, Tony Valley opened a theater on the very edge of the city of Chicago. It's in the city, but barely we're touching suburbs on the Northern edge called Edison park. It's a neighborhood here in Chicago, the whip W I P work in progress theater. It's now pivoted into a comedy club basically for that neighborhood. But what that gave me was I programmed seasons of theater and I've been a theater owner and then I've managed other theaters. So there's two types of folks. I imagine watching this in broad categories. You're either looking to like me, rent a theater and sell tickets somehow, or you want someone like me to pay you a few thousand dollars. You show up, do a show and go home. And then I have to sell the tickets to make money off of you. I've done both sides of the coin. Now more experience on the ticket sales side, but I do know when you send in promo, why did I get the job and you didn't? And a lot of the reason is print materials, social materials, et cetera. I had posters. I had postcards. I had a thousand YouTube subscribers. I had 15,000 likes on Facebook. I had 20,000 Instagram followers. And they thought, well, I can leverage that more than this other person. So I got your money. I ate your lunch. I'm also building a new theater right now. I just threw that in as trivia. It'll be in Door County, Wisconsin. I, I'll, maybe I'll do a podcast on the process of building a theater for the second time. And what a huge pain in the butt that is. I just thought it was a kind of a fun fact. I will eventually be another, again, a theater owner and manager. Oh, uh, well, let's go back to the beginning. Okay. Here's the point of today. Let me put me on the screen real quick. The point of today is that yesterday we learned how to print stuff, right? So you learned how print marketing goes from you sitting down with a designer and an idea. I want a trading card uh, that looks like Magic the Gathering. That's what I want. How do I get that from a designer without panicking, et cetera? That was, and then where do I print this? Where do I get this? Where do I get the little stupid plastic sleeve to put it in? That was all. If you missed it, you can see the rebroadcast or catch William's podcast. Okay. Now you've got these things and you really want to maximize them. You spent money on them and a lot of your time, especially the first time. It was a lot of hard work, just stress getting it done. But of the three of these, only one is fit for the internet. And it's barely, this one, barely fit for the internet. You can see why you don't put this online. Can you even read it on your phone? I mean, that's tiny. You have to get here to put it online, right? So how do I adjust to where I can use all of my print materials online and not just one? That's what we're going to be covering today is taking your print materials in the real world and putting them in what I call the matrix. And I just use that as kind of a joking way of saying Facebook, MySpace, Friendster, or cut, put them on Napster, uh, throw them on YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram, and whatever's next. What are we doing? Remember Ello? Let's all go there now. The matrix. It's putting it in the fake world. Real world to fake world is a hard transition. And there's a few reasons why. So what we're going to cover today in the beginning is some hard concepts and stay with me because the beginning is I'm going to front load you. Give me about 10 minutes of really nerding out on your brain and then it's going to get easier, I promise. But you have to understand vector versus bitmap. You need to understand image sizes. Like when I say I need it in 3000 pixels, I need it in three. I don't want it, desire it, hope for it. It needs to be done correctly or your image is blown out, fuzzy, stupid. You look amateurish. You look unprofessional. You look like garbage and I'm not going to come to your show. It needs to be 3000, which means you need to understand what pixels are vaguely. You just need to be able to explain it to your designer or use some basic editing software. And just to add to that, a lot of times because people are on the, on the web so much, that's the first impression of you. And so just to add to what you're saying, if it looks pixelated or fuzzy or blurry or distorted in some way, that's that first impression. And that's why this getting getting these techniques are so important because that's that first impression that you're giving your audience most of the time and you want to do that right. 
And we're doing this as part two, but there's no reason you can't start on social media first and then move to print marketing, which means this could be 100% of your marketing for a few months. If you're that 17 year old kid who just wrote your first show, you could probably get better. You're probably already great at Instagram, but get really good at marketing on Instagram and never have posters until like year two. So really focus, not just your first, it's your middle and last impression is your Facebook page, your mobile friendly website, that kind of stuff, right? So in order to get it right, we have to understand some really hardcore nerd stuff. But again, barely understand it's all we're going for. I'm not teaching you computer science. I'm not teaching you design. I'm teaching you to talk to a computer. I'm talk, teaching you to talk to a designer. Then it gets easy and fun. Then we get into all the philosophies and theories of how social uh, visual images, why really, why don't these work? And why do I need to change that one? That looks fine, doesn't it? Not exactly. What are the nuances? And then uniquely for calls to action, which are always important for sales. It does me no good to talk to you about all the great things this new BMW can do. If I don't ask you if you would like to buy one from me, I'm a bad salesman. Online, the call to action is a unique thing. And then we'll get into ticket sales online, not just because that's William's thing. That's what he does. He codes and develops a website. So we have an expert in the room. But I'll say with part two in particular, the ticket sales online are tied directly ties into, I'm literally on your website. The picture looks awesome. You know what 3,000 pixels are now? And right below it is a give me money button. Ooh, that'd be a good button to click, wouldn't it? So let's jump in. Here's the hard part. Take a deep breath. It's not as hard as you think. Look in the top right corner. Crack, crack that code. It says 1080 by 1260, 300 D DPI, CMYK. Now it's a bunch of, you know, alphabet suit up, soup up there. But there's three lines we need to talk about. And we're going to go bit by bit. The first you've probably seen before, 1080 by 1260, if you've bought a television, if you tried to upload a Facebook image, uh, you, those, are, those are pixels. Below that is pixel density, and below that is the color variations that you want. That's This is for printed materials, and I can tell that, and I'll show you how. Let's start with a very basic concept for dealing with our designers. One every designer already knows, so you need to know it. Vector or rasterized? It's a concept, and I just want you to get this part through your head. Vector images, I'm going to use my cursor. I'm a little laggy because I'm on my laptop right here using my cursor to drive that presentation. So it's a little sketchy, forgive me. But I'll try and stay in sync. So you see this vector image and then it shows you a zoom in close up and you see these nice, sharp, crisp edges. And down below, you see what we've all seen before when you take a photo from even six years ago. You've got this killer iPhone 4 photo of you at a birthday party and you're pulling a rabbit out of a hat or you're hypnotizing a kid or you're a burlesque performer, which I love the idea of you at a birthday party. You pop out of a cake. That's my birthday party. Pop out of a cake. And the guests are all making this scream queen face in the background. And it is a, it looks like a poster for a movie starring Owen Wilson in 1999. It is gorgeous. And you upload it and it looks like this crap. It's because those are rasterized and not vector. Here's what you need to understand. Not as a designer. A vector image can be stretched to infinity and beyond. The computer fills in the gaps. So a vector is a computer saying point A, and I'll put my face on here so you can see, okay, point A is here. Computer knows that. Point B is here. And this is just one little line of dots called pixels. And this is red and it ends as red. And so in between is always red. So it draws one line. So there's four pixels, 40 pixels, 400 pixels, 4 billion pixels, 4 trillion pixels. Well, it's just, it just draws red in between them, like you would with your mind. Now, since it's a computer, it can do that a ton of times and form an image out of them, and that's the image you're seeing on that screen. You're seeing it now, making that into an image. What it means to us is, if someone draws me, because you can't do this with photographs, or makes my logo, and I ask for it to be vector, which is normally going to be Adobe Illustrator, generally speaking, that's what most designers use. But if they say some software you've never heard of, you now know to say, well, is it going to be vector or rasterized image? <clears throat> and they'll say, oh, no, 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 it'll be a vector. It'll be a vector. I'm going to sketch it up and scan it in and then vector. I'm going to make it a vector. Good. That way, when you take over the Penn and Teller Theater in five years when they retire, and I need to stretch that line drawing of you to the size of a building, I can give the designer of the billboard that file and <clears throat> up it goes. Whereas that photograph you were using on your website will need to bring in a photographer and reshoot it in large format, big aperture, et cetera. That's rasterized. Photos are almost always rasterized, 
but you should ask for your logos if they're drawn by the designer. Uh, and your text, your fonts, you need to get your fonts, your true type fonts. You need to have those in a file. You don't need to know what they are. You just need to have them. So when your designer retires, dies, moves on, or gets too expensive for you, or you get too expensive, too high end for them, you want a new person, you can give those fonts to the new person and move on. That's vector and rasterized. The reason this matters is because if it's rasterized, you got to watch your pixels, which we'll get into soon. As long as we're here and we're covering geeky stuff, you'll see on the left there, I've put JPEG, and then you can say GIF if you want to be wrong. Sorry, GIF if you want to be right, and GIF if you want to be wrong. Uh, this, is a big, this is a big nerd debate. Uh, JPEG, GIF, PSD, PDF, and I put WTF. Uh, what are these? The ones you'd need to know for William is, is PNG. You'll need to know PNGs. Uh, and I'll let William explain that. GIF is similar to that. GIF is usually also a moving image, but it can be transparent in the background. The most common for you are your designer is going to give you an AI file, Adobe Illustrator, not artificial intelligence, or PSD Photoshop document. And those are gold. Those are platinum. You need to save those files somewhere where they cannot get destroyed. They are valuable. You don't know what you're doing? Fine. That's cool. Don't do anything with it. Save it, back it up. A few thumb drives, one at the office, one at your house, one on a keychain, whatever. Use Dropbox, use Google Drive, get it in the cloud, but it is full. Don't cut it down. You're going to need that later. That's where we screw up is we artists don't understand why the designer gave us a large file and it's 50 megs. And we think, ah, I could just save this JPEG I got from Facebook. And three years later, you have to pay someone to redesign your thing. And the difference between like an AI, that would be maybe your logo or some text. That would be that AI file. And the PSD would mainly be like a poster where you have an image and you have your logo there. And so that's kind of the differences between that AI file and the PSD file. Yeah. And then, and then PNG, you like them to use for websites, which we'll, we'll get into as we go on, because William's also going to do a demo of something that people constantly mess up on his website. But the, the takeaway here is the idea that we're going to understand vector and rasterized. And oh, by the way, on, the, on a lot of these slides, you see in the bottom where it says read more. Sorry, William and I's faces are covering it. So I forgot about it. Uh, that's an article where you'll see where I stole these two images. First of all, I want to give them credit. But also, if you are a little nerdy about this stuff and you already knew everything I just said or knew most of what I just said or understood enough of it to not need that slide, at the bottom right is a really cool article you can read to really dive in. Because if you know a little, it helps you always know a little bit more, especially when you're talking to someone. Because remember, your designer is going to be very much an expert in these sorts of things. So when you're talking to them, especially if you use a couple of jargon words, they'll assume, oh, you know as much as I do, and they'll start firing back at you. And now you'll know enough to at least process what they're saying or tell them, wait, wait, stop, hang on. I know what a JPEG is, but what was that? what's a TIFF? What, what was that? And you now know enough for them to explain it to you as opposed to just, you ever try to teach your grandmother to use an iPhone? That's what it's going to feel like talking to you if you don't understand these very basic points. A little bit easier one. We're continuing to crack that code. So we're about to dive in now to the first line, 1080 by 1260. We now know that some can be stretched and some can't. And there's a lot of different alphabet soup out there and they have different uses, JPEG, PSD, AI, PDF, et cetera. But what are pixels and how many of them do I need? Pixels are just a unit of measurement. Uh, here in the States, we have two by fours. They, they're not actually two inches by four inches. That's a whole other thing, but that's the measurement. Uh, pixels are based on photographs. So here in the States, again, we use freedom units. We use uh, inches and feet and uh, weird non-metrics. But if you walk into the local Walgreens or Eckerd Drugs or whatever, and you want a photo to hang on your wall or give to your grandmother for Christmas, you would say, what do you want? Eight by 10, four by six, that, that's all it is. Five by seven. You've heard these terms before. Certainly if you had school photos, you know, two, eight by 10, three, five by seven, a four by six and 18 wallet size. And that's all it is. And eight by 10 is eight by 10. But since photographs are never triangles or, or, or you know, octagons, I only need two sides. If it's eight by 10, I can complete the other eight by 10 and know that it's almost, but not quite square. It's two inches off square, two by four. That's what this little doggy image is showing us is that it's 20 by 24. That's it. And so the other side, the bottom's 24, it's the top's 24. The other side's 20 because the side's 20. It's always going to be two because you can extrapolate for the other two. You don't need to show me these two measurements if you showed me these two. 
And you can see that dog is getting pixelated because it's not a vector image. Everybody say it with me. The reason this matters to you is this is what people screw up. Is this is your dog logo you paid someone to make. Now, it seems simple, but someone went to school for a long time to learn how to design something this simple that barely looks like a shape, like a balloon sculptor. But that reaches a dog to me, man. I can tell that's a dog, which means someone's very good at their job of making tiny little iPhone icons for your white dog theater company. And so you probably paid that human a lot of money because they're very good at working very, very, very small. And not everyone studied. How do you iconically show Instagram or Twitter? Can you picture these in your head? Facebook, Google. Yeah, they spent a lot of money on those tiny little icons, as you would have too in this example. So you got to make sure you know how to use it, which means when you put it on Facebook, and this is what you need to take away from pixels. They exist and you need specific ones. This is Williams telling me everyone screws this up and he's, you know, he sees this on the back end since he designed his website. So when Facebook says your profile picture needs to be 180 by 180, now you know what that means. You don't even really, under, you don't have to understand it. You have to know in your software, you can't do 80 by 80 because look at this doggy. That's what's going to happen to your photo. It's going to look terrible. You can do 300 by 300 and let Facebook chop it down. If you give me more cake, I can always not eat all of the cake. But if you don't give me enough cake, I'm going to punch you in the face. That's just common logic. Same thing. And we were saying of- on uh, on for desktops on the podcast, if you right click on the image and then go to properties, and that's going to bring up a little menu and then go to details, that will tell you right there the size of your image. So if you need something specific and you go, well, I don't know if this photo will work or not. If you're on a, a desktop, uh, like a PC Windows right click it, go to properties, then details. And you can see right there whether or not it's going to match up to whatever Facebook or well attended or whatever program software you're using, uh, if it matches up to those requirements. And I I think there's the same way uh, to do that on Mac too, right, Tom? Yeah, you use preview and then tools image size. And then that's not only where you can change your image size, but you can't make it bigger. It can't create out of nothing. It's not a vector image at that point. It can only take it down. So if I give you a a file that's 2,500 by 2,500, and that's what it says on properties or preview on Mac or PC, right? And you only need 180 by 180. If it's it's the same ratio, you can change one, the other automatically change. You can take 2,500 down to say 200 by 200 and send it to Facebook and let them chop the other 20 off. No problem. What you can't do is if you have, and this is the mistake you make, you get it on Facebook and it looks gorgeous on your phone because Facebook is working real hard to make it look gorgeous on your phone. Then two years later, you take that gorgeous photo and give it to me to put on a poster to blow up two foot by three foot. And here we are with the dog again. That's what your beautiful photo looks like. It looks like hot garbage. And you hung that all over town with an ad on it. And I'm supposed to pay you $25 or $50 or $100 to come see your burlesque show. You can't even make a damn poster. And the bottom right is the current pixel size. Because this may be out of date from three weeks ago. This may change any second now. Facebook changes this stuff constantly, as does Instagram, Snapchat, blah, blah, blah. So before you export something, go and check the best practices. Click that link. They'll stay updated on that blog. But I just Googled Facebook, Pixels, profile photo, and I got this person's website. You can find that. But what I want you to take away from that is that understanding that they so matter. And that if this is just going right over your head, that's cool. Find someone who can follow me on this and have them export your photos. Don't do it yourself and do it badly. That's the mistake we're all making is we're saying, well, I don't get pixels and you're dropping hot garbage, not onto your Facebook page. Fine. Whatever. Who cares? Picture of your grandkids, hot garbage on your professional Facebook page, though. It's going to cost you ticket sales. I promise you it's going to cost you some ticket sales and more working from the negative to the positive. Good images positive images and a good social media campaign can make you some ticket sales. I promise you that as well. I've made, I've had a lot of people, we do testing on this. I was saying the last podcast, 30% came from posters because printed material, I think has a lot of value, but a good 25% came from, they just said Facebook. I said, how did you find us? I don't know. Just my friend shared it or I don't, I haven't done Facebook ads in a year. So it wasn't me paying to have it boosted. Some friend passed while they passed it along. Maybe it was a funny photo. Maybe it was me eating fire. Maybe it was me with a sword in my face. But it also had to be a certain quality or else I don't know that they would have. I don't pass along stuff that looks bad. It's just not a thing I do. So that's the top line. Decoded. 1080 on one side means 1080 on the opposite side. 1260 up here, 1260. So that's a big image. 180 by 180 is your Facebook page, right? 180. This is 10 times that size. 
So that is the size of it. Well, it's 1080p. That's a 1080p screen. That's 1080. That's where they get 720p, 540p, 1080p, 4K. That first number is where they're getting that from. That's why that, now you know that. Now you know when you go into Best Buy, that's a measurement of pixel density and pixels. Here's an easy one, because that was hard. I know. If you've never heard the term pixel before, or you thought it was just like a, a company, oh my God, that was a lot. So palette cleanser. Here's our sorbet course. This is easy. RGB or CMYK for, for chapter two, RGB for yesterday, CMYK. Okay. We're done. I'm just kidding. Uh, a little bit more on this to explain. What do I mean? RGB. And there's an article at the bottom. Again, click it. If you want to learn more, RGB is for the web. CMYK is for print. So I sent these off to my, my printer, my designer sent them to me in big old illustrator or Adobe Photoshop formats. Since I can use those programs, I exported them as high quality I'm going to say JPEGs, a little different, but basically send them a JPEG of side one, side two, print please. I did this in CMYK because I need four colors because it's going in the real world. Your phone can be more additive. So think of it like this. In the matrix, you need less stuff. Like clothes, for example. You don't need those. Clothes just grow on you and it's sexy black leather. You don't need to bring clothes with you to the matrix. You don't need to bring extra colors to the matrix. That's how you remember which one. The smaller one, and later when we get to DPI, the smaller number is for the matrix. The real world needs more. You have to be a real full person in the real world. On Instagram, everyone can be a Kardashian. So you can be a pretender there, but not here. So this was printed at CMYK, but when I put it on, and I wouldn't put this on Facebook, but maybe I'd put that on, maybe I put that side on Facebook. When I put this side on Facebook, because you can see it on Facebook, I would take it down or let them take it down to RGB. You can let them cut it down for you if you want. I can put this file up there and let them chop it down. What I cannot do is then later take it off Facebook and send it to my printer. They might print it for me, but they will not guarantee that that blue and that yellow and that pink and that red, that, that they're going to be the exact right colors because that's how the computers talk to each other. That's it. Real world, more colors, fake world, less colors, real world, higher numbers. And then I made a small note. Some printers will want RGB with ICC profiles attached. Fine. Now you know to type that in Google, go to your software or find someone who can. What I want you to be able to do is know the things you can do. And then when someone says it, you don't think, oh, this RGB will be fine. They don't need CMYK. No, they do. And, and oftentimes that's how we end up shipping not good product. 1080p, 1080 by 1260. Skip to the bottom, CMYK. I jumped over the middle, 300 DPI. This is not as hard. Pixels, I think, is the hardest concept to get. Pixels and rasterization are the hardest concepts here. We're done with the hard part. It gets easier as we go, and it's about to get super easy. So now we're talking about pixel density. It's just a matter of, if you built a sandbox, how much sand did you put in it? So your dots per inch are DPI. So you need more for the real world, less for the matrix. So skip to the bottom of the little thing here. It says 75 DPI for the web. That's barely any DPI when you consider that's printed at 300 DPI. Dots per inch. It's literally the printer printing little tiny dots. And you see with 10, you start to get that pixelization. But if you take it off Facebook and give it to your printer, you've now printed pixelization. This photograph, it's a line drawing. Maybe it's a bad example. Let me show you this photograph will not look crisp and clear if I took it and didn't have 300 DPI. My face would be fuzzy. The fire would be fuzzy. And this is business card size, man. This needs to be clear because it is teeny tiny. And the writing on the back, the same thing, needs to be crystal clear because it's small, which means you're already going to have trouble reading it in general. But particularly if it's fuzzy, it needs to be sharp. And that's DPI. What you need to understand is that it's important and you can't, you can't mess it up. You don't allow yourself to mess it up. If you can't do it, find someone who can. But now you know what to type into Google. Dots per inch. Now you've cracked the code. So 1080 by 1260 is going to be our measure. It's probably a television, this thing. But it's a TV that's 300 DPI. Uh, but it's good enough for printing at CMYK. It could also be 75 DPI at RGB. And that's a big, that's probably the cover for a website at 1080 by 1260, 75 DPI, RGB. But you start now to get an idea of, of how this code can be cracked. and then. I want William, uh, go ahead and set up your screen share and I'll click to you in a second. Uh, I wanted uh, William here for a couple of reasons, uh, but this is primary because he runs a back end. 
So there are a million people, a thousand people like him at Facebook managing their 3 billion users. And so they're constantly dealing with these problems. And the problem is you take a photograph that is not fit for the web and you've got, uh, I'm showing your screen now, William. Uh, you take a photo that's not fit for the web and put it on the web. So I wanted uh, William to walk us through one of the features, but also while you're showing the feature, show us how to do it right is what I'm saying, William. Yeah, so we're gonna go and add an advertisement image to the bottom of our ticket. So this is what our tickets look like. And at the bottom, we've got this great space where you can sell advertisements to sponsors, make a little bit more money from your shows, and they're gonna go right below these tickets here. So how do we do that? Well, first we need an image. And this would be the advertisement image. But how do we know what size to make it? Now, by going to the well-attended dashboard, we can just go to the Taming of Judge Roy Bean, click Edit, and we're gonna go to the Custom Checkout Area. And you're gonna see here, we've got an advertisement image option. And you're gonna see that the recommended pixel is 1140 by 422. So when you're designing this, you're gonna tell your designer, hey, this is the recommended width and height uh, for my image. So you're gonna give that to your designer or you're gonna design this yourself to these dimensions. Now we have the image right here. Now you can see this is a PNG and it's a PNG you can tell because the background is transparent. If you see these all, all these little checkers here, let me zoom this in. You can see all of these little checkers that are behind the image. That means that the background is transparent, which means if you have a blue website, you're gonna see your advertisement image here text but behind that is gonna be blue. In our case, we have a white background. So I'm gonna show you just what happens here. I'm gonna copy this. and I'm gonna go ahead and add the advertisement image. This is gonna pop up a little area. Uh, we're gonna to link to a URL. I'm just gonna type this in here and upload it. And you can see as it's uploading, you're gonna see these tools over on the side. And a lot of things have this option like Facebook and some other social media. Once you upload the image, you can crop it right here with a tool so if for some reason it's not the right size, you actually accidentally uploaded an image that's too tall or too wide, a lot of places will give you the option to change it after you've uploaded it. But just be wary because if you make it this size, well, that's not gonna look good. That's gonna be too small and it's gonna become pixelated. Because we designed this the right size for this site, we don't wanna crop this right now. So I'll just go ahead and click save here. Here we have the image and I'll upload it. Now, once this image is uploaded, you're gonna see that the background behind it is white. And that's because on our screen, the background is white. So the entire image is gonna have a white look to it. And just part of our feature here, we can actually link to a website. So after people have purchased tickets, they're gonna see this ad, and then they can click on this to go somewhere else. So let me show you what that looks like here. Uh, yeah, normally it would be, let me see if I can uh, pull this up here, completed orders, see if I have one. Here we go. So we, we have the Taming of Judge Roy Bean, right below it, that's the advertisement image that we just uploaded. Uh, and it looks great, it doesn't look stretched, it looks like it's the right size for this area. And you can see it's right below the tickets, the user can click on this and now go off to wherever this person uh, sold that advertisement image for. So Tom, that really wraps it up. Do you have any questions on your end before I start stop screwing my uh, screen here? No, I think that's great. Yeah, I just want people to see uh, exactly how, well, one, a real world practical application, but also hear from someone. So that's the exact same process you would do for Facebook, once upon a time for yep. MySpace, for whatever, right? And here, if you're still on my screen, you can see here's another image. This is a cover image. You would have to upload this image and try to get it the right dimension. So if it's too long, it's gonna push down this calendar way too far down. And a lot of our clients do this. They put in their poster here, and then it pushes this calendar so far down the page that you have to scroll and scroll and scroll until you even see the calendar. And so we give you these recommended dimensions just so everything looks nice and as it should be, uh, so the user experience is friendly. And I think people are doing that because we're often one man or three woman or five person shops. We don't have a ton of people. And if none of us are tech savvy and as artists, why should you be tech savvy? This, this surface yeah. stuff is what I'm going for. Cause I want you to understand the idea of like, okay, you need to understand pixels, pixel depth, pixel density, CMYK, RGB on a surface level. So you can communicate it to your team, to your designer, but also so you can then get some software, become familiar with basic stuff. Microsoft Paint or Preview in Mac, uh, Photoshop Elements is 80 bucks. Uh, Photoshop Elements will do. 
But now when you hit export, you're not just befuddled by all the different images you're going to see on the screen. And the other thing is Facebook, if you upload the wrong image size, there's nobody going to be there to help you. Uh, with Well Attended, we do watch all of our clients. And so if you do something wrong or if something just looks bad, we'll actually contact you and say, hey, do you need any help with this uh, to make this look uh, acceptable for your audience? So we try to, on our end, make sure everything is how it should be. Uh, so if you don't quite understand all this, we're here to help you out. Yeah, you're not going to get tech support. Like we were worried about doing YouTube live through Hangouts because William pointed out, yeah, if, we, if it doesn't work, there's no support. I can't ring up Google and be like, dude, my YouTube ain't working. All the millions of dollars I give you a day because it's a free service. We don't pay for it. So that's the hard part. That's understanding the technical side of how visual images are unique uh, on social media. Now let's talk about from here forward, it's a lot of philosophy. And I will warn you that I have an entire shelf a, almost full. I have 80% of a shelf of books over here on social media marketing. And they usually are also guerrilla marketing in general, but social media is part of them. There are a lot of opinions, a lot of philosophies. So I'm telling you what's worked for me, what I feel right now. I reserve the right to completely change my opinion in six months. I completely changed my opinion about QR codes yesterday. New data comes forward. Facebook changes its algorithm, et cetera all the rules get thrown out the window. Or remember what happened from MySpace to Facebook, the company completely changed, the philosophy changed. So we may all jump to Snapchat in the next three weeks. You never know with humans, we're a fickle lot and our social media is even more fickle. So we're gonna move forward and talk about how social media images are unique. This is one philosophy I want you to take in, but feel free to swim in that river because it is a never ending stream of opinions it's very new. It's also very complicated. And so everyone has a take on it and their take ex expires. Plus people like to write books for money. What we do know is this web images are different. And that's why I held up these cards at the beginning. So you could see, so print images just don't work online. Look at that poster. I love that poster. That poster works really well for me. In fact, I sell that poster after the show and it's my most popular poster. I know for a fact people like that poster and it puts butts in seats in the real world. It would not work online. I mean, I can read that right now on the screen without my glasses on on a 22-inch iMac in front of me, but I, I couldn't read that on my phone. With all the glasses in the world at 45 years old, I can't read that on my phone. And if you wear glasses in the real world and have perfect eyesight or an amazing, you know, Pixel 2 or whatever is your phone, you're screwed, man. You're not going to see that. So all those wonderful quotes from the press are lost. The website's lost. Even the phrase, yes, for real, the punchline to the joke is lost. Plus my, I mean, it's just bad. The bottom one you see, now I just put 28, it's a placeholder. It's not an effective ad, but it's an effective photo, picture. If it were Rolling Stones and it said tour, picture of Mick Jagger and Keith Richards on stage. Boom, close up, close up with their face. It said tour 2019, coming soon at that size. You would there, There's an effective beginning of an ad. So someone's starting an ad campaign. Hey, I hear that the Rolling Stones are going back on tour. And then you can see that in your Instagram feed where they start to sort of drip that out to you. But you understand why one is good and one, one is very, very bad and one is readable. So why are they so different? Well, first of all, always remember the pixels. That's just for loading stuff up to Instagram in general. I'll put that there at, at first just so you don't mess it up. You cannot just upload any garbage you have on your phone to Instagram and hope for the best. If it does not fit, don't make it fit. Find another solution. Take another photo. Talk to your designer. Beg for help. Message me text William at me on Twitter. I don't know. Find some help. Don't just load hot garbage because it's the only option available to you. It's not going to help you sell tickets. Why are you wasting your time? Square for some, but not for all. So th this is the, these next few all kind of link together. Why do I say square for some and not for all? Why can't I use the same image for Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, etc.? Why can't I use Hootsuite or I use buffer load one picture in there and have it go to all three. Well, the answer is the third thing. Each social platform speaks its own language. Learn it. This is a philosophy you'll work with as you go. So Twitter is very hashtag dense, as is Instagram. But on Instagram, you can't put links. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. If you put tickets on sale now on your photo and you link www.mything.com, I can't hit it on my phone. I can't click it. So on Instagram, the culture has developed a workaround. 
it'll say, because of course people are trying to hawk stuff on Instagram. You see some hot dude who's all ripped and he's so creatine shakes are the secret to my success. Buy some now. Use promo code. I'm a big muscle head dummy at checkout. Link in bio. That's the way they say it on Instagram. Link in bio. It means in my biography, my profile. It's an old term from gaming bio. Uh, in my profile is a workable link. So if you go to the Freak Show Tell uh, Instagram page, you'll see me doing that. And then if you go to my, I'll say, uh, uh, a blend of science and history mixed with insanity, a uh, touring show in Chicago, always put where you are in your bio on Instagram, by the way, what city you're in. And then if you are like me, a touring performer, mention that. It drives me nuts when I have a band. Tickets are on sale now. And they're like, in Worcestershire. Worcestershire, Indiana, Worcestershire, England, Worcestershire, Australia, Worcestershire, Mars. I don't know the name of your city. What state, what country, what zip code are you in? Remember, we're international now. Also put the year 2018 or 2019 on your posters. Some of my posters hang up for eight months and people are like, is that coming or is that? It's December and it says June. It, what side are we on here? Is this old or is this guy just way ahead? Remember that now. But the link in bio thing is important because you don't do that on Facebook. On Facebook, you just type the link. And it'll resolve, it'll make it into a magical clickable, clickable link where the photo becomes clickable. Facebook's helping you leave. Facebook's other half, they own Instagram, is not helping you leave. Twitter's a whole other thing. So see, if you didn't know that, that's what I mean. Learn the culture of the sandbox you're playing in or find someone who can help you. You also put up square images on Instagram. So there's my Instagram image. Doesn't that look great? With a cut off the, the what? Don't know, because it's this shape. Now, you can cheat that on Instagram, but don't, not at first, not until you know what you're doing. You can load something that looks like this onto Instagram. It's a little tweedle in the bottom that'll do it. Don't. Stick with Square until you know what you're doing. Same thing with Facebook. Don't break the rules until you understand the rules. We learned that from improv class. First, you learn the rules, then you can break them. Don't start playing on the margins. Same thing with Twitter. Twitter, I think people accept more often sales pitches. It doesn't bother me as much. If you're constantly saying tickets are on sale, tickets are almost sold out, tickets go on sale next month, tickets go on sale next week, or buy my creatine powder, use coupon code on Big Dumb Muscle Head. That doesn't bother me as much on Twitter as it does on Instagram or Facebook where it will annoy me. Learn that as well. Where can I really hammer them? And they don't mind. I don't mind getting hammered on Twitter bothers me elsewhere. That's because the way the interface works. That's just because the way the computer program works. So that's what I mean when I say they speak their own language. It is a language, man. It is a philosophy. It is often a culture. The young people are on Instagram. The old people are on Facebook. Scumbags are on Twitter. It, I can't imagine what YouTube comments would be like the cesspool. It's, oh, it's, what is, what is it? A, it's barter town from the Mad Max movies. Um, but you, if you want to play in that culture, you've got to learn that culture and or embrace it. The other thing you want to keep in mind is a goal. When you find an image, is this an image for Facebook event? Because that's a different shape. Or an Instagram post. Is it a tweet? Is, is it hashtag? You start thinking like that when you look at the image. Oh, this will be great for Instagram. This will be fan. This tells the story of my show. This is me popping out of a birthday cake at a bar. And you can see patrons' faces and they're holding drinks. And it's this beautiful nightclub. And that is my burlesque show in one single photograph. I'm, I have a goofy face on, but my boobs look awesome. And that's my character on stage. Bam, that's your Facebook event page, your event photo, right? You start looking forward and saying like, okay, how am I going to use this in the future? This is always important, but I'll argue that on the internet, your call to action is even more important. You always have to, in, in, there's a, I have also an entire shelf of books for sales, for how to sell anything from Apple computers to stock to cars. The sales philosophies are also huge. You have to ask for the buy, ask for the sale. You have to close the deal. It's the hardest thing to do to show you all the great features of this new Toyota Hyundai 2019 or whatever. This, eventually I have to say, so can we put you in one today? Hey, how about you give me some of your money now? Would you like to go out with me? I have to ask for the sale. I can't just leave it. So calls to action are always incredibly important, but I'll make the argument that a call to action online is, is not just doubly important. It's 10 times, 10x multiple important. If you're looking at my poster, it's in a bag, forgive me. If you're looking at my poster, there is a lot of friction between you and giving me your money, right? Let's see if you can, I gotta hold this up so you can see it. Uh, if you're looking at my poster, 
ton of friction between this poster and your money being in my pocket. You've got to see the, the website address. I'm a bad weather man. The website address, you've got to type it into your phone and then you've bought tickets. Well, you know, the steps you got to go to well attended. You got to type in your credit card number. If you don't have a saved account, blah, blah, blah. That's a lot. That's a lot for you to give me your money to see a show. If you're online, <clears throat> I mean, you are this close, man. You are one click away. Boom. And God forbid you have autofill set up in, in Chrome or Safari. It's you start to type your first name. It fills out all your information. You click buy. It clicks. Are you sure? Yep. And some tickets arrive in your mailbox. You are so close to being done to being ready to make that money. So focus on your call to action, get a couple of eBooks online. You can get them cheap or audio books are cheap on Amazon and spend four or five bucks for five-year-old books. Calls to action do not really change that often. How you do it changes. The philosophy does it. Selling someone a terse sell. That's why I have books on that. I don't sell cars. I don't sell computers. I don't sell stocks. But the same philosophies and techniques apply to selling my tickets. So online is unique. Because not every post needs to be a call to action. Uh, every post leads to a call to action. We are there to sell tickets, but also if I can entertain you a little bit, construct the narrative, I can keep you engaged and keep your attention. If you go to the Freak Show and Tell Facebook page, and you should, uh, you will find the last couple of posts have nothing to do with my show at all. They're just kind of vaguely science-themed posts that are funny. Just things that I thought were humorous and I shared to my what would you call them? Fans, followers, uh, friends and family, people who've liked the page of Facebook. I put it up there and it's kind of nerdy and kind of funny. And I, the thought is, if you like my nerdy, funny, weird show, well, then I wrote it. So I know your sense of humor. This, I think, is funny. So pro same guy, probably same writer, director might be able to pick content for you. Why am I doing that? It's because I want to keep you engaged. I'm building a narrative. The one thing almost everyone who listens to these particular workshops has in common is we're visual storytellers with very few exceptions. I don't know if there's any monologists in the chat room right now, but the vast majority of us are what burlesque performers, sideshow performers, magicians, mind readers. Uh, we've got traditional theater companies and what do they all have in common? You tell stories using props and set pieces and costumes and visual visual you don't just stand on stage and even when you do long shakespearean monologues you do them while in the period or you do it as a sci-fi setting we're visual storytellers we are good at building a narrative visually so do that do that on instagram don't just use one image build a story i got two examples so the bottom image there is just a call to action the photo people have seen more than once if they follow me on Instagram, Twitter, et cetera. It's me eating fire. You saw it on the business cards I held up earlier. Show starts January 27th, 28th. Come see it. And then I would put in the text on Instagram that I type, I would put link in bio. And that's it. That's enough for you. You get it. Click the link. Watch my commercial. Watch my video. Watch Read some of my reviews and buy a ticket or don't. That's all I'm asking you to do is consider buying a ticket. Um, I actually would put city, state, in the, I would have typed Chicago, Illinois, but that didn't need to be on my image. It wasn't necessary. Up top, you see no call to action. This is because I'm also building a narrative, and this can be a little hard to understand. If you're following me on Facebook, I'm not just trying to sell you tickets. There's also character involved. Uh, not just the character of my show, which in this case happens to be very close to me, the way a stand-up comedian is almost the same person on stage that they are off stage. You kind of shed some stuff and go on stage. I am, this is, this is, these are my pajamas. This is me. I'm overdressed. William and I were talking about that earlier, that if I fly, I judge you if you're in sweatpants and I don't judge you nicely. I don't care that you're comfortable. You look terrible. I'm that guy. I'm that uppity prick with a monocle and a parrot on my shoulder. That's me. So I'm in the bespoke suit that I had made myself in foreign countries. People know that about me. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I joke about that character, that kind of douchebag overdressed guy in my show. So then how does this image make sense? Well, this is me being Frazier at a Merle Haggard concert. I don't allow children in my damn show. <clears throat> you got to be 18 years old to walk in the door. And really, I prefer that you were 23 with a higher than average IQ, if you don't mind. Why the hell are there 5 billion freaking little children surrounding me right now? And why am I not lighting them on fire to get them away from me? And this is the idea. If I were a sitcom character, this is a funny situation. I somehow have gotten myself into a position where I'm street performing for kids. And by the way, that's a Brooks Brothers suit. 
I'm wearing a $1,300 tailored suit to lie on the street in broken glass under the girls behind me. She's a volunteer. She's going to help me out in a second with what looks like the worst bodyguard in the world. A five foot three Latina is my bodyguard, my security. The secret service is with me. And I typed that story on Facebook. How the hell did this happen? Well, we're doing an outdoor circus show is what it was. And it didn't occur to me to not wear an expensive suit because I love that suit. It's one of my really nice suits. It costs me a lot of money. I'm not a wealthy man. That's a lot of money to me. Oopsie. To me, this is hilarious. This is Frazier getting stuck at the rodeo. Oh, I don't. What's going on? C-3PO. What's going on over here? Why are those people? That's me. That's my character. I'm very much C-3PO. I'm a fancy man. I don't understand. What's? I'm a theater person. That's the character I'm playing. And so to me, this is hilarious. And it didn't get a lot of shares because sharing that doesn't make sense. Your friends don't know me. But oh, my friends piled on. They're like, good God, I would love to have been there. To watch you deal with children would be, I don't have kids. I've been with the same woman for 21 years, married for 16. We know what makes babies and we've avoided making them. Why? I don't like your kids. <laughs> Screw your kids. I don't want to deal with them. So watch me deal with children is like a grumpy, it's like Archie Bunker dealing with kids. It's like, what do you want? Okay, cool. All right, go get it. I don't know. Ask him, do you have a mother? Find that. That's what I'm posting. So it got a lot of engagement. It got engagement because they knew me. It, I was mocking myself. They, it started like a roast. They started mocking me. And yeah, I should be mocked. You should love children. I'm, I'm not a full human being. You should like kids and dogs. But you see what I'm doing? I'm building a narrative. That's important. You don't always just beg them to come to your show. Sometimes you just are a superstar. I don't know. Let's review. Uh, vector versus bitmap. We got that. Vectors stretch forever. Bitmaps get pixelated. Be careful with your bitmaps. Your bitmaps are rasterized images, your JPEGs, your TIFFs, anything that's finite. You understand pixels. More importantly, you understand how to use them. How to not screw it up is really what I want you to take away from this. How to not mess it up. That's all you have to do is just avoid messing it up. That's 90% of the battle. You now know what 300 DPI at 1080 by 1260 CMYK means, or at least you have a very good idea of what those terms mean. You know at least enough now to form a complete question to Google this stuff, to find other YouTube videos of people really drilling down and explaining it to you over and over and over again. And that's what I want you to take away from this. You understand that social media has its own language, which is something people mess up all the time. That Twitter and Instagram might as well be uh, French and Russian and Facebook is Korean. They are not the same language at all. Their own culture, their own style, et cetera. And then you understand the incredibly complex world of calls to action. That writing to sell online is a lifelong endeavor that you're gonna work on the rest of your life. That you need to build stories, build narratives. You always need to be building character. You should have a character on stage, right? You should have something like I do. You should have a clear idea of who you are on stage and off, and then be able to, I don't know, mock that, play with that. If you're Chris Angel, make it look cool. If you're, what's David Blaine? He has a character. Chris Angel has a character. They're very different than Siegfried and Roy who were characters, almost caricatures. The amazing Jonathan, you know, that, that sort of stuff. When I, when I say these names, iconic images, iconic ideas come into your mind. That's not by accident, dude. That's good writing. They worked their butt off and we can mock them. Believe you me, I've mocked both the Blaines and the Angels and a little bit the Roys. But I got to tell you, at the end of the day, you got to give it up. They have created a strong character. You've got to have a call to action. You've got to move through a call to action. And this is why I wanted William to come here today too, because I want to talk about this. This butts up against it. This is not a way to put an ad in the thing. You have to understand this because you will have wasted so much of your time. I mean, an hour right now. It's so much of your money. If you cannot get to the point where you are then putting tickets online and they are buying them. I have a system I'll recommend, but you need a simple system. Whatever you pick, you cannot pick a garbage website that doesn't sell tickets, right? You need, first of all, a mobile-friendly website that I will call frictionless. This is also called pain points or choke points in sales. All it is understanding that between you deciding, between me pitching you that I want you to come to my show and you deciding if you want to come to the show, there are pain points, right? And my job as a salesman, as a performer, as a producer is to eliminate those pain points. So the first thing I need is a good poster. So I got to catch your eye. That's a pain point. How do I get you to even look at it? So I need a good poster. Then the poster needs to be data rich, but well-designed. It can't look like those 1800s ads with just text everywhere. And a new, a never before seen establishment. The PT Bottom Circus presents Jumbo the Elephant live and on stage. Women are warned to not be in the, you don't need all that anymore, right? 
it's hard. It's hard, but you need date, time. How much? Am I a hundred bucks or am I $12 or am I free with purchase of two drinks, right? That data, pain point. Take out your phone. Go to my website. Huge pain point. Find where to buy tickets. Find more and find the commercial. Find images. Find video testimonials. Find whatever it needs to sell you the rest of the way. Saw your poster. Looks interesting. I like hypnosis shows. Went to your website. Saw your picture. The same picture you all do of your hypnosis show. Maybe you got a watch in your hand in yours. And then I started reading. Oh my God, Johnny Carson. This guy was on Johnny Carson. I love John. I grew up on Johnny Carson. He was on Jimmy Fallon too. This guy did two Tonight Shows with two different guests. Oh, oh, there's a clip. Oh, this guy's hilarious. Ticket pain points, right? As you move along, you've got to eliminate, see why I call it friction. You've got to make it smooth and buttery. Your money must glide effortlessly out of your pocket and easily into mine. And a lot of times we consider this to be a funnel, right? So you start kind of wide of posting stuff on Instagram, on Facebook, on whatever that social media channel is. And then you get them to your website where you're going to see videos, more information about you. If they want to dig deeper to know who you are. And then on those pages, it's going to say, click here for tickets. And you're slowly funneling these people in from going to broad to funneling in, to clicking to buy tickets, to picking the dates and times, and then actually making the purchase. So it's this funnel that Tom's really talking about here. Yeah, and that that funnel needs to be an easy slide. I absolutely hate it when I've decided, the hard, you did the hard part, man. You got me hooked. I want to see that hypnosis guy I just made up who was on Fallon, who killed, and I can't find a way to give him my 40 bucks. Well, screw it then. I'll go see something else. I live in a big city for a reason. They will abandon the purchase at the slightest bit of friction. So I want you to think about it as a customer experience then. The most powerful advertisement you're going to get, forget social media, forget printing all the posters in the world, forget banners and all that stuff. Word of mouth. A good 25% of my audience the last run came because they'd either come before or their friend had and recommended it. That word of mouth confirms the purchase. It's happened a hundred times where I'm thinking about going to Hamilton and my friend went, oh my God, you have to. It was amazing. That word of mouth, it confirms purchases, it creates purchases, it creates buzz. And that customer experience is important. And to me, the customer experience is from the poster to the website, to the parking lot, to the show, to after the show in the lobby, back to the parking lot, to our recommendations for dinner. I think of the customer experience, what they call a 360 view of the customer experience. From the moment you're getting dressed to leave the house, Do I have proper directions and a link to Google Maps? Not something weird. Google Maps on my website. So you can take out your iPhone and click it and it opens up. And you can now, I think about that. That's important to me. These pain points are important. So do things like make sure you have ticketing policies. If if someone doesn't make the show on Friday night, for whatever reason, they got drunk, they forgot, they're late, they clicked the wrong date. Are they allowed to use a ticket on Saturday? Whatever you just thought's the answer. I don't know your policy, but have one. Don't be making that decision right then. Think about these scenarios, your customer service. And then when I rent theaters, I let them know these are my box office policies. If you want daddy's money, you follow daddy's rules. Or you don't book me. It's in the contract. These are my policies. I need to know this stuff. So when I talk to theaters, I let my box office know how I want things done. I leave nothing to chance. I do not want the nightmare scenario of you bought a ticket, you thought you bought a ticket, you came to the show, you bought a ticket for the wrong day, and the lady behind the counter was kind of a butthead to you. That's that's terrible. You drove across the city of Chicago. It's a nightmare to drive here. It's 45 minutes to get anywhere. Or you took a train or a bus, you got a babysitter, now you can't get to see the show. This for me is a, I can't, I cannot abide it. So see, nice big links. Where do you get your tickets? Well, I'll give you two guesses. Where do you get your tickets? You can clearly see these buttons. And if you click anywhere near there, by the way, click the photo, click the white space around the tickets. So you you go, I don't understand how buttons work. I'm going to click right here. Fine. Don't care. I'm going to click his face. I like fire. Don't care. I'm going to click the name of the show. Doesn't matter. I've tried to eliminate as much as I can with computer code, all of your possible frictions. That's why I'm using Will Attended. He's not just here because he's pretty. He's also here. It helps. It helps. <laughs> He's also here because he's an expert on back-end programming. He's very good at running workshops, to be honest with you. And uh, and that well-attended website, and there are others, but I'll tell you, man, I, yesterday I crapped all over all over brown paper tickets, and I never get tired of doing it uh, just because their website looks terrible. 
there are other solutions if you don't want to. I don't want to push too hard, but I it's a strong recommendation that you make a website. But I, I want William to hear you. Do you want to share your screen or you want to use my uh oh no, you can just keep it right right on this if you want to go to the next one too. Yeah, got it. Uh, just to talk about our podcast just for a moment, then we'll go back to well attended, but we do have over, I think 74 episodes right now that you can go to. It's just wellattended.com forward slash podcast. And these, we've got guests like Tom Britton, Joe Diamond. Uh, we've got theater producers, magicians, burlesque performers, circus performers. All of these people have come on our podcast to give their advice on how they go about marketing their shows and how they run successful businesses. This is completely free. Like this workshop, you can go and you can listen to these and really learn about how to market, how to get your shows to becoming uh, successful. And then our software kind of goes hand in hand with this because our goal is to make that experience for your customers and for yourself as smooth and as user-friendly as possible. And as Tom was saying, we work one-on-one -on -one with our clients to really figure out what you need and what processes you need to have in place to make that from going from Facebook to the patron buying the tickets, just run as smoothly as possible. Go ahead and go to the next slide here. Uh, so if you just want to sign up for an account, uh, just go to wellattended.com forward slash sign up. And I'll just personally shoot you an email uh, if you're watching this for a one-on-one -on -one demo so I can show you exactly how the system works. And then we can kind of, kind of have a brainstorming session to figure out what you're doing now with your print marketing, with your social media, how you're selling your merchandise, which is what we're gonna get to in part three. Uh, we've got ways that you can sell your merchandise before your show even starts, uh, that way you can make some money on the front end and not all in the back of the room. And so we can just be kind of brainstorm, have some marketing discussions on how we can help you and your shows. Just go to wellattended.com forward slash sign up. And I think this brings us right to the next uh, part part three of our print marketing masterclass here with Tom Britton. Part three, we're gonna be talking about how to use your print marketing. So we've talked about how to design it, how to use it, how to distribute it, how to convert it to social media. Now we're gonna talk about how to take that same material and sell it in the back of the room. And we're gonna be talking about buttons, uh, trading cards like Tom have. Can you show us some of these printed materials, Tom? Yeah, so I've got- We're gonna be talking them. about uh, programs, all of this stuff that you can now sell and make money on uh, for your shows. And you've already got this, so why not sell this in the back of the room to make more money? And Tom's gonna be talking exactly how to do that with Well Attended, how to sell tickets before, and how to sell those, how those, uh, how to sell your print material at the end too, that way you can make the most money possible from your shows. Yeah, I found that, uh... 25 to 30% of my audience would buy what I call the swag bag, uh, which is uh, just a bunch of paper products, packs flat, easy to store, easy to ship. Unlike t-shirts, which are bulky, but think like t-shirts. I was selling 10 bucks. Uh, they cost me about a buck 25, including in the bag. So this should be in the bag. I took it out, but this should be in the bag. So it's facing that way. So what do you sell that bag for? This is 10 bucks and it's a buck 25 that I sell for 10 bucks. So it's a good $7 and something cents in, in profit. Um, and you would say most of your audience buy, buys those 25 then. to 30%, uh, over the last five weeks. Uh, so, you know, yeah. And I, and what was nice was off of the profit from the swag bags, it was almost exactly what I paid in rent, which again, that same way that like, I think about, okay, as of today, I've sold 25% of my tickets for next month. Cool. I can breathe. I, I'm right now making $0, which is fine. I'm not losing money. In the next three weeks, I will sell enough tickets to make a living. Awesome. So when I, in week three, have sold enough swag bags to cover 75% of my rent, I think, oh, that's awesome. Because there weren't a lot of other expenses, which means that every ticket sold is just money in my pocket. If you're not selling stuff in the back of the room, you can choose not to. I did for a long time, but make the choice not to. Because what you're saying is it's not worth the money because you're leaving money on the table. That's acceptable. Not everyone needs to be hawking stuff at the end of their show. But I found that people really like the experience in theater because I like the experience. I enjoyed, I keep using Hamilton's last show I went to. Uh, but when I went to see Book of Mormon, I couldn't wait to buy a t-shirt or a program or a mug or I don't know, a coffee. It was a cool evening and I wanted a memento of my time there. From circus, we know this. You want to take stuff home with you. So if you don't sell it, print it and give it away. Package it up and give it to people. Include it with the ticket price. 
but start thinking about that because it completes a customer cycle. It isn't just me making extra money. It's that 360 experience. I was excluding my customers um, from getting what I wanted when I went to a theater, which was an amazing show, easy parking, some place to eat afterwards, really good directions on their website, easy way to buy tickets. And a t-shirt, a ball cap. I wanted a thing. My wife got at Hamilton. They make a drink called the Hamilton. And they serve this boozy mixture in a Hamilton souvenir. It was very funny. It was an adult sippy cup. Because you're taking it in the big expensive theater. They want you to spill it. It's sitting on her. I can see it right here. It's sitting on her little booze shelf by her desk in the office here. She kept it. She put it in a place of honor. I was denying my customers that. So it isn't just that I paid my rent. Even if you only sell a bookmark for 50 cents and you make 28 cents off that. So you make $10 a night start thinking about having some stuff in the back of the room, just because it really, for me, it was a whole, that I'm 45, I've been doing shows since I was 16. Why didn't I have t-shirts? I didn't think they were important. I didn't need the extra money. So I thought, well, why be greedy? It's not just greed. It's a customer well, it's, experience. It's funny you say that because I just went to a show, like a comedy improv troupe, and they said, hey, we're going to be out in the front meet and greet. If you guys want to meet us, just come come by and say say hi. Just line up in the aisle way and we'll we'll make time for you. And it's funny because the whole, I would say probably 85% of the venue lined up in the hallway, like stretched down the entire, entire room. And I heard people saying, I hope they have their t-shirts that they're wearing on stage for sale. I hope they've got their CDs. We, we hope we've got this stuff. What should, what can we buy? Either we get through the line and it's just them, you know, talking to people, hugging to people, taking pictures and not charging anything for that. And while that was cool, like the meet and greet, being able to say hi to them, I was really, and I think other people there were expecting for them to be selling stuff, something because we want to support them and we want that memento, as you were saying, uh, from that experience. And so that kind of struck me as odd that they weren't selling anything. They were also from another country. So maybe that played into the equation. But uh, it was just interesting to, to hear the people in line wanting that merchandise where normally you would think, oh, the performers are, they're just hawking their stuff. Don't people get co convinced or talked into buying this or they get, they feel pity for the performer. So they go buy, but no, really people want this material. And so if you have that available to them, as you were saying, you're really playing towards your audience and giving them something to remember the show by. Yeah. We're niche performers and I'm a big metal guy, big metal head. And so when I go to shows, a lot of times, if the metal band is good, I know that spending 10, 15 bucks on that CD, or now it's a thumb drive with a ton of so it's a really good value. Now it's 35 bucks for a thumb drive with their entire discography for this band you just heard that night. But if I see a band on stage and they're good, it's almost like tipping them. I usually pay five or 10, maybe 15 bucks to see these shows at bars. It's not a lot of money. And I know they're not, there's six people on stage, dude. And there's three bands. Like they're, they're not making cash off this. So I am happy. If they're, especially they've already done it, they've already performed. It's like tipping a street performer at the end of the show, tipping a waiter at the end of the meal. So like you guys were badass. What an amazing band. That's awesome. I feel like 10 bucks for three bands is a little undervalued. I would also like to buy a CD. And if you don't have one, it isn't just a matter of greed. That's what I was wrong about. I thought it's just them being greedy bastards. As a customer, I want to support. I also wanted the music. Don't get me wrong. Also the, three of those songs are on my iPod. Like they're great. Um, but even if you're kind of struggling and I don't necessarily want the album, I want a t-shirt. It's a way of throwing a little support to people. So sometimes it's about you. Sometimes it's about me, but at, at book of Mormon, it was about me, man. At, at Hamilton it was about me. I wanted a t-shirt and I know you guys are getting paid equity. You're, you're not suffering for money. God knows the producers aren't. I want, my wife wanted that cup. That's why she ordered that drink. So yeah, definitely come to part three. If you've never done merch table, we're going to cover how to make it, how to print it how to set up a retail space, how to price things. A lot of the business, you can tell I'm really into the business and marketing of this stuff. What multiple do you use? How do you do inventory? Like stuff that artists just don't know unless you've managed retail spaces. And then philosophies, mostly stolen from bands because they are the masters of selling merch. If you're any kind of performer, you can do this. But if you're a magician, good God, you're leaving thousands of dollars on the table. You can sell so much stuff at a show if you do magic tricks. And this workshop is tomorrow at 1 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And uh, Tom will pin a link to this next one as the first comment here. So you can just very easily click on that and then join us tomorrow. Uh, Tom, to wrap up this workshop, how do we find out where you're performing? So if we're in your area, we can come see your show. Yeah, uh, go to freakshowtel.com uh, or Google Freak Show and Tell. And get on my mailing list. I'm saying mailing list because right now Facebook's being real sketchy with showing people things if you like my page. Um, 
if you're in South Carolina, if you're in West Virginia, if you're in Illinois, Michigan, or Pennsylvania, uh, maybe Ohio. There, I'm talking to Ohio for uh, late April. Uh, but any, see that circle I just drew on the map? Any of the states in there? Get on the mailing list because I know I'm coming to all of those except for Ohio is not signed a contract yet. But all those others are on my website right now. Most of them are colleges. The nice thing is like you can come see me in Detroit for between 15 to $50, depending on what kind of seats and whether you want dinner, we do dinner in a private dining room before the show kind of thing for 50 bucks. Um, you can come see me right outside Detroit. It's not actually in the city, but right outside the city of Detroit. Uh, and then like a lot of the colleges, if you're allowed in, because most of the schools, 70%, 80% are students only, you get in. You maybe could sneak in, but you know, you'd know you be sneaking in. But about that 20 to 30% when they allow the general public don't charge very much. And I mean, like it's free to anybody. They've got a thousand seat theater and they expect about 200 students to show up. So they're like, yeah, dude, invite, invite whoever you want. Go on the newspaper. We don't care. And then a few schools once upon a time, I haven't seen this lately, they used to charge, but it was a pittance. It was $3, $5. So you can see my $35 show for five bucks because the college is paying me to be there. They're, they're underwriting the show. It's like a sponsorship thing. They set the ticket price. They've already paid me for my time. It's a booking, right? So I think it's a real good way to, you know, see an evening of theater at your local college or, or you know, community center, whatever they're doing, wherever they're booking me. Just real quick. Can you just share your screen and show us where we can join your mailing list? Oh, yeah. Hang on. Uh, let me give me just a second. And I completely close. I completely closed Chrome. <laughs> Putting you on the spot here. I just know we had some questions yesterday of, of, hey, how do I get on your list? So I just want you to be able to show oh, people. Gosh. Now give me one second. I'll, um, because that is, that is kind of cool. Uh, it's very, very simple. I can tell you that. Let me share my screen, which is always a adventure. There we go. So now you see uh, contact. It's under contact. And then down in here. So here's join the old mailing list. See it right there. Make sure you can see it. Yeah. And then down at the bottom, here's some the common social media. And then I added a bunch. Look at the bottom down here. That is ridiculous. Uh, Ben's in town. If you want to follow me there, I don't even know what that is. Uh, I think that's Vimeo. This is Vimeo. Yeah. yeah. Pinterest. I got a Pinterest now. Uh, it's mostly I just, just want to see what's on your on your walls. <laughs> I it, it can't just, imagine. It's all photos, but I've been using Buffer to share them to Pinterest. I thought it was funny. I have a Tumblr account, very similar, Snapchat, blah, blah, blah. But the big, the big ones. Here's the email. If you want to email me directly, if you don't want to get on the mailing list, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. And those are the, those are the big four powerhouses. All the rest are. I even have a Google Plus, but I didn't bother linking it down here because they never got beyond 2% of the social traffic. So. And staying on this page, what I really like, can you go back to that really quickly? I really like how easy it is though for you that you've made it for people to buy tickets uh, from this right here. You can see Detroit and Chicago tickets right there, like very visible. This is where you go to buy them. And the idea with this page is that funnel. So, okay, look right here and I won't let it play for too long, but there's a TV commercial, right? And so there's in 30 seconds, that's what you really need to know about the show without spoiling yourself. If your friend said it was a good show, you don't need to see a lot of data. Here's your TV commercial and you can see all these rave reviews. You go, okay, cool. And then choose your ticket. So all these are the same link to well attended, but then when you click, you get the well attended site and you'll see my live events in Detroit. And you can just pick one. And then there's, there's the basic tickets you can get. See what I mean? 50 bucks for dinner. Or you can get a VIP package for two for two fifty, or you can just come see the show for 15, etc. Um, and then here's a map, a regular Google map. So most people go, oh, yeah, I know where that is. Yeah, there's there's 696. There's the yeah, Regal Tower. I know where that is. Boom. But also there's, you know, addresses on here. And then some photos next to every photo is a call to action. Here's a couple of more videos. There's a 30-second commercial again, but then also a teaser for a slightly different how to eat fire, right? And then sales pitch. Who loved it? Blah, blah, blah. And again, get your tickets. I don't want you have to go back up once you're sold. The idea is when you get here, you go, yeah, I want to buy. And then reviews. So I've designed a And that's that course. GIF you were talking about, right? That's a GIF. So it's moving through. It's a slideshow on Squarespace. They convert it to a GIF, but it just shows you that. This, I like these because Yelp and Facebook is like Tina N. I don't know who that is, but it's it's not a professional reviewer or a critic. I think I actually know who Alice L is. She might actually be a friend of a friend. But Anthony M, no idea. And so that's kind of cool because it's more powerful to me. Uh, and so when you put up critics for the small time can be powerful because we can't really bribe people, you know, but critics for the big time, I don't fall for it, man. I, when they say guardians of the galaxy nine is a, a fun romp through the Western of space. And it's somebody I've never heard of in Cincinnati. I assume the movie, movie's crap. But if my friend says you have to go see guardians of the galaxy nine, it reinvents the entire series. The franchise is restored. 
that has power. So I use my Yelp reviews, my Facebook reviews. They're also at the bottom because at that point in the funnel, I really wanted to have completed the sale. It kind of goes back out. Like if I needed some more stuff, I put it at the bottom. Really, by the time you hit that, the reader loved it and you read that article. If you're not sold, well, then maybe go see a different show. You might not want to see my show. I'm not the right show for everybody. You might be like, I don't think this is for kids. <laughs> yeah, it's not. <laughs> you know, go to a different show. Um so I want you to make a fair decision. I don't want to just sell my stuff to everybody. I don't want to rip people off and have them buy it and not like it. I want to give a fair representation of my show. And that bottom, I consider like the flare. It's sort of selling past the close is the term we'd use, but it gives you some extra data. Um, because I found that when I try and tell people about shows, if I'm walking them through the page to try and sell them on Book of Mormon or whatever, usually it's YouTube videos I'm using. I like more data than I really need. That's yeah. the idea. Well, Tom, thank you so much for coming on part two and really talking about how to take that print marketing that you've had designed, converting that into uh, images for social media, explaining uh, what all of those terminology is and then how to actually get that on uh, on the website. So I, I just want to say I learned a lot from this. Hopefully our people watching this on YouTube have learned from this as well. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot Tom an email, shoot me an email. It's William at wellattended.com. We'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. And I guess we'll see you guys tomorrow for part three. Thank you guys. Have a good day.